maybe we're at a tipping point where we can see that the risk of making a harmless mistake is so incredibly high. How long are we going to let our young people be subject to that kind of deadly risk? Stand your ground laws effectively provide a pathway by which the property owner and the person with a gun can shoot first and ask questions later, as long as they claim that they were in fear for their lives. There is a documented, empirically grounded racial impact of these laws. I do believe in all the research I've done that they were specifically designed to have that kind of effect where disproportionately white property owners who are armed are encouraged to use lethal violence against people who are strangers, especially people of color. The only people who had recourse to the castle doctrine were people who owned the castle, the owners of homes, specifically white European descended men. Women didn't have recourse to the castle doctrine, especially if they were attacked by their own husbands and their male family members. Indigenous people did not have recourse to the castle doctrine when settlers came to take their land. And people who were enslaved at the time of the establishment of the United States certainly had no right to defend themselves or their homes or their families against violent incursions by white people, specifically slave masters. I started conducting my research directly in response to the killing of three unarmed black teenagers in 2012 and 2013. Trayvon Martin was shot and killed by a neighborhood watch person who was claiming to defend himself in 2012. Secondly, Jordan Davis was shot and killed by a white man who didn't like the music that he and his friends were playing in their car. Finally, in 2013, 19-year-old Renisha McBride wrecked her car in Detroit late at night. She went looking for help, knocked on a door. An armed white homeowner came to the door and shot her straight through the door, killing her. Certainly that's a pattern. And there's so many other cases we could look at too, where armed people, white people or white seeming people take a young life by claiming self-defense. I knew that stand your ground laws were relatively new. The first official stand your ground law was established in Florida in 2005. It spread from there very quickly to the point that right now we have some two thirds of our states have some variation of a stand your ground law. But back then I, I saw this pernicious pattern and I thought this reminds me of a sort of historical pattern that is very much rooted in identity logics and the logic of so-called stranger danger, where we as Americans believe that we have a sacrosanct right to defend ourselves with force, especially when we are faced by someone we consider a threatening stranger, very much rooted in our ideals of uh, racial bias and stereotype, which are also very much gendered stereotypes and perceptions of threat. My hope is that more and more citizens of the nation are paying attention to cases like Ralph Jarls, an innocent teenager who simply made a mistake, rang the wrong doorbell and was shot in the head and the arm. And thankfully he's gonna survive these wounds, but what kind of trauma 
is this young man going to carry with him into his life? What kind of trauma does this kind of tragedy exert on his family and his community and beyond that across the nation? Hopefully this is a wake up call for our nation to take action and to do something finally to roll back these stand your ground laws, which so terribly distort our already problematic criminal law landscape by reversing uh, the roles of the victim and the perpetrator, because essentially what happens in so many of these stand your ground cases, especially when the person who's been shot does not survive, is that the only narrative available comes from the shooter. And the shooter is able to retroactively frame that person, the person they shot, as the perpetrator.